Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes to let everyone into the room and to let some people uh, who might be logging in last minute come in. But hi, everyone. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. It is evening here in London and my name is Louisa Oliet and I'm curator of talks and events at the Photographer's Gallery. We're delighted to be here this evening with artist Ingrid Pollard. Based in the UK, Ingrid has been an important figure in, in photography since the 1980s working across that medium and language and print to explore themes of representation, mythology, and hidden histories of the country's rural landscape. Today, she will be joined by curator and researcher Ego Ahiwe Swinski, who is calling us in, calling in from Minnesota. Ego is an archivist, artist, and a current PhD student at Chelsea College of Arts and Tate. In her work, she aims to develop collaborative archival strategies in relation to physical space, the public, and the personal in relation to the diaspora. Together, they will be looking at Ingrid's process and the role of the archive and what it means to be working today in Britain. After Ingrid's presentation and the discussion with Ego, we will move to comments from you. Uh, you can submit your questions through the chat function here, or they can be posed directly uh, to Ingrid by using the electronic hand function um, here over Zoom, and we will then ask you to unmute yourselves. We will do our best to respond to you. However, given the number of people here today, we'll be unlikely to get to everyone. The event should last roughly an hour or so with the last 20 minutes dedicated to Q&A from you, with you, I mean. We, so we are approaching this event in the same way we do all of our public programs, which is with the aim of creating a form of trust and mutual respect. So please keep that in mind when exchanging messages. And we look forward to seeing you here again soon. I hope today's discussion um, inspires you and that we see you again in the gallery, um, hopefully, uh, which is now open. So thank you again for joining us. And now to Ingrid Pollard and Ego Huey Swinski. Hi. Hi, Ego. Hello, everybody. Glad to see you. Um, I don't know if we're going to go straight in or we're just going to say hello to Ego as well. Hi, Ingrid. It's good to see you and be with you and be with everybody today. Looking forward okay. to the conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation as well with all the people that are here and with Ego as well and Louisa. Um, so I just have a kind of 15 minute presentation at the beginning. Um, this is kind of laying out some of the themes that were mentioned before. And I'm just going to go through uh, three different works that are quite current that are, that are presented in the last two, two or three years rather than going back 30 or 40 years. And there's something that's reflecting, the work I'm doing recently is much more about the figure in particular, particular spaces, rather than it being about rural issues or metropolitan areas or things like that. It's very much about the figure in particular spaces. There's also looking at archives, uh, my material practice being fundamentally photography, but it's um, going in different areas or it's always been uh, lens based on photography has been the kind of basis, but it goes other places as well. And also talking about um, the rep repetition, the persistence of kind of empire, colonial ideas, nationhood, and citizenship. And currently, you know, internationally and locally in the UK, that's, you know, it's a hot subject. It's being reformed. People are thinking about it. So that's the light my practice is hoping to shine a light on that rather than talking about very um, poignant activism in a traditional sense, it's kind of an artistic response to that, looking for agency if I'm working with archives and kind of respectful agencies, the people in the photographs. So first I'm gonna share my screen 
and go through the images, if that's okay. It's gonna be about 15 minutes and it's three bodies of work. Uh, so, sorry. Okay, off we go. So it's a piece of work that was um, at Baltic last year, it finished earlier this year, and it's 16 of 78, 17 of 68. And it's looking at what I think about in terms of the, the African in particular spaces, whether it's a representation as these are, or 3D objects as well. And it's how that, how those objects, those particular figures operate in the landscape they're in and the wider landscape around the UK. Sorry, Ingrid, are you sharing your screen? I don't see anything. Oh, yes, uh, I'll start again. Cool, I can see it, thank you. Sure thank you for reminding me. Seventeen of sixty-eight. It's a recent work that's shown at Baltic, as I said, and it uh, finished last at the beginning of this year. And it's looking at a particular African figure in the landscape in the U in the UK. Whether it's this type of representation, a three D object that's there in the landscape as well. When it was shown at um, the Baltic, it was it became an installation. So there's a number of objects, photographs, text-based, redacted. Um, text as well and there was no kind of clues or indication or signage around the gallery so how the audience chose to negotiate it was their choice so it's the kind of dialogue that's going on between the different uh, figures the different photographs the text as well so the large text it's part of um, it's text from a book where a lot of it is redacted so there's one particular story coming through about a particular figure, African figure. And it's thinking about that's, that happens as you go around the UK, you see these particular figures. Oh. Moving on. It's how you start, can start to be, think of those figures as Africans rather than the black figure. And, and that contrast between the rural and the city. And so it goes beyond um, a definition that's totally based on race or the other, all those particular old ideas we have. And it's just thinking of Paul Gilroy's book, After the, After the Empire and be, both be, After Empire and Between Camps, where he's talking about a much more human and humanistic idea of race, where race is starting to disappear. So it's so much more to do with conviviality and making a new set of relationships, which is kind of underlying the kind of political activity that's around the moment, that you don't have those particular banners and ideas about people. There's something else that, that's possibly in a utopian future that's going to happen where you're not always defined by race. But to do that, things have got to be thrown up. But that's some of these, it's thinking about that, these two contrasting landscapes but there's something that's uniting them and it's also something that's breaking them apart. So some of these are inscribed in the buildings itself. So it's talking about the history that's going, the long history, but also the local history and the history that's is pointing to a, a, new, a new future. So that when you throw light back on, on the past, it becomes different. So the, the history is always changing rather than the future's potentially going to change. So there's also something, these are also about light, what you can see, what you can't see. I mean, quite literally with these embossed pieces. So a lot of them you have to either go up or stand back from all the images in the gallery space to understand what you're seeing. So there's kind of obvious ideas about who you go up to, who you move away from, how you understand them, what you see and what you don't see, and also the fundamentals of photography.
So this is kind of a uh, sort of 25 year research looking at these particular figures that change over time. Uh, they don't usually last more than 10 years out in the weather. So it's, you know, revisiting sites, photographing them again, working with them again. So they're, yeah, there's a kind of, my history is within them, even though it's someone else's representation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, residencies, which I've done quite a lot. And this was uh, work called There Was Much in Interruption. And it was a work both in Northern France and then Lancashire. I was doing both the residency, residencies over a nine month period at the same time. So I was going from one site to the other. So there was a chateau uh, in, in Northern France near Normandy. And then there was looking at an old cotton mill in Lancashire in Briarfield, which is it's a huge site. It's now being taken over, I think, by a football team and it's being developed. And there was also an artist project within this huge building. So I was working with two sets of um, workers, the artists, which I saw they were in that site and also the farm workers that were in this chateau. But the farm workers were now volunteer uh, environmentalists who came to work within the grounds of this chateau and it was based in a particular way um, the garden and, and the farm area it was a very particular type of design so, and also the artists were working in those in the um, cotton mill as well I was working with <clears throat> a camera obscura so I was taking portraits of both the people who are working in the chateau and the, the artists that were in that site as well so it's kind of using camera obscura. So you're you're kind of intervening on light on a on a surface rather than a camera. But I was using digital camera, so it's both working with light, but then recording it digitally. But then you've still got the qualities of compressed light within it, and that's happening both in France and in Lancashire. There's a certain amount of abstraction because they're both. There's a sense of detritus and things breaking down in both sites as the chateaus losing money and becoming different and then the, there's a lot of detritus within the the whole areas of the cotton mill as well so there's looking at the light and the abstraction and decay that's going on <clears throat> so there's always looking at as well as the detritus there's particular just tiny details that are affected by the lights the growing plants the decay that's in the mill. And then within the chateau, I was surrounded by a Toile de G wallpaper the whole time. So I was picking out those in the bedroom I was staying in. It, people know what that's like. It's a representation of a, rom a romantic rural idyll um, played out with people um, treading on grapes and cutting corn. And then there's the landowners singing and dancing. So it's that big division of labor being reinforced the whole time. So I was trying to cut across that. And there's also the idea of labor activity as well within the meal that's now finished. So these are the farm workers, the people in France. So it's the same camera. The light quality is different, the people are different, but there's something about the communication that's going on between us. You know, they're, to do, they're to do a particular talk, a particular work, and I'm having a negotiated conversation with them through photography both the artists and the people who are working the land. <clears throat> so I kind of like that, the way we have to negotiate what we're doing, different things there, but we all have particular roles and it's how we work, work, work those out, work those out. Mm. So talking about the detail and the abstraction that was going on, the idea of not, with the abstraction when you don't know if it's a large detail or small detail and I started as I walked around particularly northern France around the uh, first world war sites that were always around there so I was visiting those a lot and just writing about their experience at those sites going back to the chateau going back to Lancashire back back to London it was that that crossing so it's just trying to record it photographically and text-based semi-poetry and then talking about light quality and camera obscura and then part of it ended up with these wallpapers which were mimicking the Tuadaji wallpaper that was in the bedroom I was in but I've kind of dropped in my own present-day workers 
uh, in both sites. And also I was collecting uh, glass plates from the kind of historical ones from the printing that went on in Kamazi in Ghana. So they're dropped in as well, just extending that idea of um, the work and colon colonial connection. Because this, within the area I was in, they were growing sugar beet and that grew up when the sugar that was coming from the Caribbean started to die down and became too expensive. So it's, you know, kind of particular trail that goes through to the Caribbean as well from those sites and the relationship of cotton to Pakistan as well. So yeah, they were both working towards a kind of colonial involvement in both the Caribbean and in England. If that makes sense. I'm not quite sure. So it's the last piece of work and it's look, again looking at, um, it's looking at an archive um, that was in, I was, there were two parts. I'd commissioned by autograph to hand tint a series of images from the Caribbean photo archive in New York. <clears throat> it was the, these images from 1890, you know, it's 30 years after emancipation, they're in Jamaica. And these particular images were, were the photographers, the Valentine brothers, the Valentine photographers from Aberdeen were sent out by the government to go to the Caribbean particularly Jamaica, these ones, to present a series of very picturesque images of these sites. It's, you know, it's a form of gentrification going on through photography, but also I've been to a kind of a couple of museums and they have these series of like 10 pictures, these particular Valentine brothers, their father as well, that it's both armchair travelers, but it's also to send out to property developers. And it lays out, look, you see there's infrastructure, there's roads, there's telegraph wires, you see the demarcation for land ownership, there's fencing, there's, and of course the main commodity is there's people to work there. So it's supposed to say, look, come to this place, develop it, there's plantations, there's systems, you can come and make money from here. But the, at the same time, they're very picturesque. And I've seen the equivalent of contact sheets. So there's a number of, uh, there's a number of photographs from the same angle, but they're all slightly different. So you tell people have been posed and presented and uh, people who know this area of Jamaica said that particular ferry is still there. But it's looking at the landscape, particularly how it's verdant and potential, a lot of things to grow, there's potential there, but it's to sell it in a particular way. So they'd have the uh, people who are living there, African descent. There's also images of the South Asian population there. And this one I've seen, there's a number of different placings of these people. So these were large images. I spent quite a long time just staring at these pictures as I tinted them. It took hours and hours. And I started to see there, there were lots of, there's the main pictures. We can see how it's been laid out picturesque, but on the edges, there are lots of little people who are just looking at the photographer, observing what was going on or him, what, what was going on. And I kind of think of them as, as escapees I presume they wouldn't know they'd be in the photographs, but they're, they have a particular type of agency that they're part of the event, but they're not in the photographs and not under the control of the eye of photographer. So I became interested in them and interested in the idea of how you can work with an archive, with a set of people who I don't know their names, they're all deceased, and how I kind of respectfully work with an archive, photographically as well. Uh, using digital imagery. So it started off with these tinted images that were part of an exhibition with the wider archive and then these hand tinted ones. So I started then, had a, also had a trip to Jamaica and this is Mount Plenty uh, Farm. It's, it's an also, so I started, twisted the tinting. So the colors there, but this is a digital image so the color is the digital color and the manipulations in the black and white. And this is a site, uh, a, a plantation. So though those walls, those limestone walls have been made by enslaved people. So that's the thing that's their labor is highlighted through the color and the, the land that's growing now is the development that's been through it being made a farm now. So yes, yeah, so just starting to think how can I intervene into the, an archive very obviously, so I'm intervening as a photographer, as an artist. 
So, but then keeping some of the integrity of the original image. So it's using Photoshop quite distinctly so you can see it. And I was concentrating again on the people who are looking at the photographer, they're giving eye contact and by extension, they're giving eye contact to the audience rather than the, the photographer's eye, this particular picture. So I've very obviously used Photoshop to highlight, bring out the people that I'm interested in. And some of those people are looking through windows on the edge of photographs, still looking back. I never know quite which one. So this is one of the few images. The guy with the donkey is one of the photographers. But I, I was interested in the, the labor that was going on. People who are working on him. He's not going up on his own. There's always going to be one or two people, three or four helping him with his work. So that's what I'm interested in, the one that's behind again. He's looking at the photographer, but then he's not the main object. And then using photo, Photoshop in a very distinctive way. So I kind of moved that Jamaica going towards the French Martinique, French speaking islands. Um, then I also started to look at the real um, contact with photographs, the means of photographs. This is much later, this is 1910, and this is St. Thomas. But it's one of the few pictures I found where the, a young person from Jamaica, from St. Thomas, who's actually interacting with the photographer, I means touching the camera as well, but then still thinking about how the photograph, there's, a, there's two photographers, there's this image, there's the photograph we can see, and then there's my intervention, pulling out the pieces that I'm interested in. There's a whole series of these uh, photoshopped uh, images. Whoa. And then one of the final ones was this large manipulation of a Emancipation Day celebration in, in Jamaica as well. So it's, see, uh, it's almost playing with the, with, the, with the audience. What can you see? What's happening here? What's in fact happening? What, you know, there's a, a trick going on but then you're also being drawn into the scene, but it's a multiple cuts. So I think, I think that's it. I finished. Ingrid, thank you for such a generous um, presentation of your photography. Um, and I wondered because, and you mentioned though you are a lens-based um, artist, you use a number of different mediums. Um, I just wondered if you could talk maybe a little bit more about um, how you choose um, the medium for each piece um, and the kind of different techniques. We've got hand tinted, we've got Photoshop, um, and I know that you use a lot of film and you like to use audio. So just wanted to maybe um, have you just talk a bit more about your techniques. Okay. Um, well, it's all in different mediums and the way mm -hmm. using them are very much, um, that's the fun part for me, which which thing is most appropriate. Usually that comes quite early on, whether it's just scale of photographs or it's uh, uh, making it very obvious that when the audience is engaging with these images that they know they're looking at, a, they're, they're lo looking at a representation of something or there, rather than, I'm interested in the film, but I have quite a commitment to the still image, um, whether that's a representation of a, a page of a book um, so yeah, so I, I'm quite committed to the still image. Um, and it's part of interrogating the history of photography, you know, those hand tinted, I've got some of those other postcards from the Valentines and they're hand tinted postcards, but they're real photographs that you kind of buy and there's the kind of um, the hand tinting done by the, the well-known photographic artists, usually men, but then there's the mass produced things which will be done I think that painting will be done by women because it's slowly work, you're gonna damage your eyesight and it's about mass production. So 
there's something about labor in all those postcards as well and who's wielding the big cameras and being celebrated as an artist and so that's it always been the interest in tinting that it's it's about labor but at the same time and um because i did film and video there's something about narrative and storytelling so that it might be that we look at text within it and the scale of text and redacting some out or uh, in the 80s and 90s, it was, there was a lot of text-based work within photographs, within painting as well, cutting up newspapers and things like that. So that's a particular thing about lack of money, I think a lot of the time that you use what's at hand, you're not going to get beautiful screen printing unless you're really, really fortunate. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I'm interested in the history connected to each of those particular mediums and how what happens when you clash and you make it very obvious. So it doesn't matter if you don't know photographic history, because that's my kind of subject area. But it, uh, within, we're kind of all sophisticated, quite sophisticated at reading images, so that if you put a um, picture from Vogue, it means something different from if you put, uh, I can't think of a common or garden magazine if you put them in the picture they mean something unbeknownst to us so if you put in the tv times or the radio times or whatever that's going to mean something in the photograph so they've all they've got history and a weight so i'll choose them for that and it's also it's a it's the fun part how do i work with my medium um you you also spoke um a lot about agency agency for you, agency for how a viewer might engage with your work. And um, it really made me think about just sort of ethics, particularly living in a time where we all have our kind of camera on our phone and it's mm. easy to just snap without thinking about ethics. So I was just wondered if you could just maybe expand a little bit more on why that's so important to you. Yeah, I mean, the big difference is now is phone, you can take anybody picture but our, my early days of photography it was very much about going up to someone with your camera and saying can I take your photo that might be the start of a really good conversation it's coming from a, a documentary background which you know a photographer might take months to get to know a particular family or community and then start to photograph them and it's it's just how you work with your medium so but it's kind of changed now there are photographers doing that and negotiating and working with particular communities or people they know with photography and film uh, and performance sometimes so that's happening but it's sort of different but if i'm working with an archive that's that's um it, it, it can be easy to just take something out and put it in and chop it and edit it and crop it to see the view you want. And I try very hard not to do that. But then at the same time, I'm tinting it, I'm working with Photoshop, but also want to make those things very obvious that I've intervened for a particular idea and I can be questioned on it. So I can only negotiate with the person, Patrick Montgomery at the time, who, whose archive it was, and he spent 25 years accumulating these images and cared about them and cares about them quite a lot. So that was important. And, being introduced to them through autograph and it's a very particular set of images and that's what we're doing. So those kind of ethics and where it's going and the costs and everything is very clearly laid out. And I guess I, I don't do that snapping with my camera, even with a, with a digital camera, it's so easy. Even that it feels, doesn't feel okay. But um, that's because I've gone through a particular journey with photography but but it's important because black people have had the image images for one thing stolen since the beginning of photography and they've been manipulated they've been classified using photographs and the link between photography the police medicine classification of people you know photography has a very dirty beginning so I'm always aware of that. I've got to, you know, I've got to carry that heavy sack with me and, and try to fight against that. I think 
So that's, that's always in the back as well, that, you know, photography's got a dirty past, right from the beginning, from day one. Um, you use the archive a lot, and I just wondered um, about the role of your personal archive um, in relation to maybe exhibitions, or particularly the exhibition um, recently with Radcliffe Hall curated by Mason Levy, yep, and Laura Guy, and just wondered if you could, though you didn't um, share that in your presentation, maybe just talk about um, some of the works that was included in Hot Moment or, yeah, yeah. Glasgow International. Yeah. Um, yeah, personal archives, I mean, personal archives, my stuff, you know, my negatives in the boxes and everything. And it's, they, I mean, it, if I tell students, if you turn up every day and you take some photographs, eventually you'll have an archive, where, you know, 25 years later, you just have to turn up and take photographs. Um, so, I mean, I try and approach it the same way as I would anything ethically. So both the hot moments, the, re the recent one and down deep, oh, da deep first, damn, the ones yeah. that was in photograph in, in Glasgow International. Um, both you know, people in Radcliffe Hall, they, you know, I find their ethics, you know, they're laid out, they're right on the top. So I trusted them straight away, the way they approached it, the way they approached the other photographers the whole context of Glasgow International where it was shown. So it was, it was always a negotiation from the beginning and the second show was also a, a negotiation because I kind of knew a lot of the photographers in the show or I knew their work and in the second, in hot moments, I kind of knew those other photographers quite personally. Um, but we still had to ask everybody in the photographs that were still alive that we could we could use their images and everything I have to do it that takes a lot of negotiation and talking and which ones you can use which ones you can't use um so that is you process with the same ethics and because I've got that thing that's called an archive now it's, it's kind of valuable when people want it get approached a lot and other photographers of my generation people want it and um trying to work out what what how you approach that and how you deal with it i've been at working in glasgow women's library as well looking at their lesbian archive and as the same questions are coming up over and over again how you actually work with that to honor the people in them you don't obviously sometimes <clears throat> they don't want their photograph shown ever ever again within that so you always have to negotiate and ask people that's the only that's, that's the way I work with all of those in my own personal archives and my family's archives, which I got as well. Uh, negotiation and uh, you have to be respectful. Um, <clears throat> After sort of 25 years of sort of collecting and revisiting sort of, um, sort of the black boy history throughout the UK um, and bringing that together in your exhibition, like, because you're using your past, um, your personal archive and just like Joni mentioned, um, it's not sort of history, or it's unity, history, local history, and it's not quite the future. Um, you, you kind of reversed it in a way of, um, so I just wondered what it was like to bring that body of work together um, after, because it's quite temporal as well, when you're saying that some of these images only or last for around 10 years. Love. Um, so that kind of going back and forth and commitment to that narrative. Just wondered if you could speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, the actual real signs in, in, out in the weather last 10 years, that, that's what I meant, rather than my yeah. photographs. Um, I mean, I, I just came across, long, long time ago, I came across one and I just started, apart from being really scary, um, I just began to wonder of any more representations of, you know, people of colour on any signs. And it just sort of took off from there and tried to visit them all. Um, and because, they, you know, those signs, when you get them on the ground, are great big things, actually. And, you know, they're out in plain sight, but it's like, how come no one's commenting on these 
this representation of black people in this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. And talking to people, there's, they have a relationship to the sign, they have a relationship with the, their local pub as well. Um, but gathering them together they, and having the objects and the sign and the book, um, pages from the book, there's some, this, they become independent of me. They start having a dialogue with each other, you know, as the, the figure is looking at the sign you know, other signs looking out across them. And, and as an audience, you walk through, you cross these gazes and they, sometimes you can get to look at them and something's returned to you. So they, they took on their own power in that particular space. So it was interesting what, what happened there, how I, I could leave the room and they're still chatting with each other in a particular kind of way. So it's not a, you know, it became about that African figure. A lot of them are African there. I came across a couple of, the Arab boy as well, and their representation was very different, but it was kind of North Africa. Uh, so yeah, they, they take on their own power and their own identity when, when I leave the room in a peculiar sort of way. But it is, there's a dialogue going on between them. I can't hear what they're saying, but there's something uh, when I put them all in a room together, because I have shown them just as flat photographs, tiny little things. And then that, that becomes, they're much more delicate and, uh, um, they're much more delicate and I'm fearful of them, but when they were took on their, they breathed into their real size, something else happened. So I, I presume they'll go on to do other things. Um, in regards to your residencies um, and that kind of going back and forth between Lancashire and um, France, the north of France, in some ways, that thread of community and relationships runs through all of your work. Um, and just wondering if you could talk maybe a little bit more about the transformate, um, that kind of history, um, the transformation of history within a place um, or a site, really that you um, kind of captured, the image that you shared of um, the two buildings juxtapo um, juxtaposed, it's almost like you marry them in a way. And I just, how you make those connections, just makes. Well, that was quite a unique one. Usually if I have a residency, I go to that one place, but because they were happening at the same time and they were, they were similar, but very different at the same time, time just the light quality was different the, the bricks and the stone of Lancashire and northern France is very different and it was you know quite a crumbly chateau but it was kind of beautiful and old worldly at the same time <clears throat> and there was a contrast between the two types of workers the volunteers that were coming from the US and from France were there for a particular amount of time and then they left and I, I got involved in the gardening as well in the house, you know, in the chateau, which was really good. Um, uh, that's the, both those two, there's was, was a few times where I felt very outside of the two communities, even though I was embedded in them. It might be the, the going to and fro and, um, yeah, be going to and fro. And that seemed to be the only way to link them eventually. And then the opportunity came to, show the work as part of an exhibition Holly Hollybush Gallery. Uh, so then it's kind of making them into something else. But usually when I do residen residencies, it is about being embedded in that community. And again, how we can start to talk about how the photography is going to happen, because that's, that's my job there. And they, they might be farmers or they may be teachers or something like that. So, so the type of conversations you can have, even when I went to Jamaica, it's very particular because they know I'm there. They know the parameters of our relationship and they know I'm going to go eventually. So they, there's a way you can, they can start to be much more open with me because uh, I'm going in a certain extent. And so can you make them more revealing or make them, they have opportunity to be quite much more revealing or to show me or tell me things about their area. So that happens a few times and it's quite unusual. Uh, you know, it's a great bit about it and vice versa to a certain extent. So, and they, 
because I'm observing them as a as an artist, they're also observing me as someone who's working their community, and they are the expert usually about their community. So sometimes they might, they're very interested in what I do look at and chose to throw the light on or take a photograph of it. So uh, it's kind of a bit of a win. It's not always great. I don't want to make it sound hunky-dory. There's, there's, prob- there's troublesome relationships there that develop as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, every, every residency is different, but that one was unusual because they were together and it was kind of making sense of decay in both places, the moment of transformation before the um, the cotton mill becomes the sports centre, etc. housing that it is now. The artists are still there doing their, you know, really good work in situ, doing very good work. So that's there as well. So I, I was there in a particular moment and then something else happens after. In some ways, hearing you describe that, I think of um, the postcards from Valentine and Sons and mm. almost like you're now the photographer with all that going around around you in some ways but I wanted to move on to um, everybody's questions and, mm-hmm. on. Um, and I have a question from Siobhan um, So it says, um, I use Ingrid's images, um, pastoral, pastoral interlude, etc., about Lake District and the black presence in rural areas now in the Netherlands. And it is as if they were taken yesterday. The concerns in those images are as potent now um, in the Netherlands as in the 1980s in the UK. They're very useful to raise questions about visibility and important now. I'm not sure what my question is. <laughs> Could you comment on this? Um, well, I can be as direct. I'm, I now try not to talk about pastoral interlude too much. I like the fact that people continue to find them valuable, but my direction is now black people who are now the range of black people particularly young people that are going out in the landscape, countryside, whatever you want to call it here, the black birders, the gals who hike. There's a number of organizations, wild in the city. That's my reference point now. People who are actually going out, taking that, you know, why can't we go here? We're going, we're walking, we're gonna do whatever we want. Julian Burke, you know, who's talking about race, but also, you know, she's, doing work, she's on country file, all that sort of thing. So those are the people, my reference point now, not so much looking back to the colonials and why aren't black people going? It's like, it's not true. It hasn't been true for like 40 years. So I'm glad people are taking it up, but I, I don't want to have that type of conversation again. Because there's loads of people going, black people going out, that's the people you need to speak to, what has motivated them. The black bird is particularly, you know, in the U- US as well as here, there's, there's a, some sort of sea change happening that the metropolitan areas are not the only areas that black people are being marginalized in they're being marginalized in the rural areas as well but something's ha- something's different happening and that's what i'm interested in um i've got a question here from naomi pierce um and she says ingrid you mentioned a number of residences one in Normandy and one in Lancashire. I wanted to ask, what is your preferred way to get to know a site? What are your tactics? Do you reach for the camera early on or do you experience it firsthand for a while? Take notes before you represent it visually. How long ideally do you need to engage in a place or is this totally site dependent? She also feels like she may have um, answered. Well, Naomi, all of all of those, all of those. I mean, I did a um, work, a residency in Lee Valley, which is just up the road from where I live, so I was very, very familiar with it. When I was at school doing my A level, did a project about it. So, like, ten years later, I do another one. So it's all of all of them. Some I know very well. Some I I just come fresh. But I usually there's a time of doing big research because you know you'll know you're doing it and then there might be a couple of months so that's the time to do you know book research and 
recce visits. Um, so the note taking is usually with a camera rather than uh, alongside note taking and and I get great gatherer of things and maps and geology and all those sort of things and speaking to people. But it's all of those things. You start with a camera or you don't. Um, but usually when I meet people, I don't get the whip the camera out straight away. It's just scary for people. Um, I usually ask, if I'm there on the site, I'll ask people to just take me for a walk, even if it's in an urban area, take me for a walk that they like or something, because they, they get really excited if it's one they really like and they want to, you know, this is where the dog fell in the lake or the duck bit my finger. So all that stuff is really interesting. And, but it's all of those things that Naomi said. I do all of those things. Yeah. Got a question here from Anthony Spira. Um, Ingrid, you talked about embossed text pieces at the Baltic, which are difficult to read and make you go up close or look sideways. How important is the physical act of looking and moving and different perspectives to your work, in addition to the ob obvious subject matter? Uh, well, that's, that's it. I do want people to look at the work, I mean, sight and um, light, light are the two things that working within photography and that's what I manipulate, you know, the light, whether it's digital and you're manipulating uh, the data and cells. Um, what was the question again? Oh, I, go, I moved it down, sorry. Okay, no problem. You see it? Sorry. Yes. Um, how important what is, is the physical acts of looking and moving? Okay. And different uh, perspectives to your work. Yeah, that's so always important. Um, even in, in the gallery space and both outside, it is recording the light that's there, you know, the electricity in the form of light. And in the gallery space, there's some idea. Usually, I don't want any labels, but you can't, can't often have that. So that people, you know, there's a, an echoing of wandering, not the flannel or anything romantic like that. It's just how you make a definite decision, how you're going to negotiate it. Some people, if there's no labels, then it's, it's uncomfortable for them. So there's usually some indication or context for people to work their way into the show as well. I always have to do that, but not labels. But yeah, so something like being in the gallery echoes my walking and the discovery that happens. And it, but it's also a dialogue that's, I've laid out some things and now we can have a rummage around them, to make something and we can have an, an, another dialogue whether I'm in the gallery or not. Yeah, so movement's important. Um, and I know that you like to dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've got a question from Linda Kuwit. Um, Ingrid, what advice would you give a person who is about to do a body of work that deals with the juxtapositioning of settler and indigenous people? Uh, uh, it depends if you know the area or the settler community or what's the connection. I mean, it's that situation if you're talking about Romanies or I don't it's it's a very wide question I don't quite know how to answer it it's, it's wide settler and I don't know how to answer that okay. I need a bit more context or it needs to be smaller I'll move maybe um, come back to, yeah um, from Rachel Capabila um, Capabila Capovilla, um, what project work do you want to do that you have yet to do or want to be asked to do? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have enough in my head of things I'd like to do that I'm never going to fulfill in my lifetime, but I'm always, I love to be surprised by someone asking me to do something. Uh, I'd like to do, I'd like to do a bit more traveling, even though uh, I want to do less of it. Um, I'd like to do something around um, performance in, involved in a large 
camera obscura, the inside outside of a camera obscura and how you communicate, uh, how you communicate. You know, you mentioned dance, so the inside and outside, people inside the tent, tight size camp, tent size camera obscura can see what's happening outside and your point of view is all skewed. So how you communicate the inside and the outside and how people communicate inside and outside and how that then that's recorded. So that's multiple sites, multiple figures, and then it's the rendition of that. I've been thinking about that for about 10 years. So I'd like to do that. Doesn't have to be in England. <laughs> Could you, could you talk a little bit about um, the work that you did with um, Shakespeare Globe? Yes, yeah, pretty much figuring like that. So it was a, a Shakespeare's Globe on the Thames. Uh, it's Richard II. And it was, it was the first kind of all women of colour um, actors backstage, photography, music, players. It was all done by women of color. Uh, and Adjurando was both uh, director and star and producer to a certain extent. So it was, took place over six months. I was there from the very first reading to the very last day and it was a fantastic experience. Uh, and all those kind of workshops and learning about Shakespeare it was a fantastic experience to do. So. It was on over probably about a month, month or so, six weeks at the Shakespeare's Globe in repertory as they have. So it was within the music, the clothing, the design, the presentation, they were drawing in all those um, uh, West African, Caribbean, South Asian. Uh, there were all those elements within it because of the fights, the fight sequences were capoeira rather than swords you'd have in traditional Shakespeare places. The dresses were influenced by all those different regions. The music was an element of lots of, lots of different cultures jo joined together, but not like a, a mishmash. There was kind of reasons for doing everything, but it was transporting and making Shakespeare. It felt very relevant and humorous. And there was a turn because it, the, all the cast were women. There was something about turning the female characters within the play. They had a different kind of emphasis and they didn't want any of the female characters to be wimpy because there's the queen in it is usually portrayed as kind of, she's not got a lot going for her. So she had a lot of agency, a lot of power within it. It's just a little, a little um, twist in the, the reading, but it was a fantastic experience to go through. And it's full of all those, um, so many phrases that are in everyday la English language now. So it's fantastic. I hope lots of people saw it because it was absolutely brilliant. I think it's on YouTube, that entire play, but great. Um, and just one last question from Elaine Humbleby. I've just introduced um, a series of, and, um, I've just introduced English work to my students to engage them in representations of young people and exploring how to engage in the obvious and more subtlety, subtle narrative of a series. But, um, very interesting conversations ensuing about presentations of gender and cultural her heritage. Um, actually, there's not actually a question here. Um, they found that it's more commentary, but I'll read it anyway. Presenting them with images that have also been tinted in the world flooded with instant images also intrigued them. They found it hard to comprehend the reason for the intensive labour involved and why one would do it. So, I, I suppose... <laughs> what, in tinting? Uh, <laughs> I assume. But I also wonder if you could speak to, because you are also a great teacher and I've had the honour of witnessing you deliver workshops to young people um, using pinhole camera. Um, so I just wondered where teaching and still working with the next generation and the future those of all. Uh, yeah, I've probably done 40 years of teaching. So I do it slightly different now. It's not every Wednesday and Thursday you come up and you do 
photography. It's uh, a different way, different types of conversation now. But um, yeah, that's, you know, it's the whole idea about giving something back, um, talking about photography, even if, you know, talking about lenses and all that sort of things, pinhole, camera obscures, 19th century process. I'm kind of interested in all those. So I want to meet other people who are, can talk endlessly about lenses and light and go for a walk uh, with our cameras. You know, photographers are the worst walkers. We're very, very slow. We're stopping to look at that cloud, look at that light. So yeah, teaching is always part of it, but how I teach is very different now. It's not um, day in, day out because it's very exhausting, which is what it should be. The students are there to suck the life out of you because that's their job, even over Zoom and everything. So I do less of that now. Um, so the type of conversation is different. It's an overarching discussion of themes rather than the minutiae of day to day, but I'm still interested in that as well, but it's more short term. Uh, yeah, different type of teaching. Well, um, I want to thank you, Ingrid, um, for your generous presentation and answering the questions. Um, and I'm going to pass back to Louisa, um, who's going to bring the evening to a close. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Ego. That was really beautiful. And thank you for your generosity. Um, I just wanted to extend my thanks also to my colleague, Janice McLaren, for the additional support. And lastly, to you all for joining us this evening and for your ongoing commitment to the gallery. We really wouldn't be able to do what we do without you, so thank you. If you have a moment, we'd love to hear from you. And I have a poll at the end of this, so if you can be a little patient with us, that'd be great to hear some feedback from you. Um, anyway, I hope you're all okay. Please keep checking our website for updates on forthcoming program and for more information on how to visit the gallery while we still can. And I feel like that was a little bit pessimistic, sorry. Um, we have an exciting autumn program with artists, curators, and writers like Mason Lover Yap, Sunil Gupta, Mark Seeley, Trevor Paglin, Diana Marcosian, Christina DeMille, DeMille sorry, and Rice Kabir. So please keep checking our website for updates on that. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Ego. Thank you, Janice. Um, enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I'm gonna stop recording now. May turn. That was great. Thank you so much. Oh, great. <sighs> um, oh. I'll go with emails tomorrow, but uh, there's still people in the room and everything. So um, thank you again, Ingrid. Okay, thank you. It was great. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yes. Sorry, can I just give? Oh, I'm still just... here. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. You guys can stay on. I mean, that's okay. no problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you um, for allowing me to bump my way through that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just really appreciate you. <laughs> managing to navigate my questions as so, so, so. <laughs> no, it was great it was great I was bumbly a bit but yeah mm, beautiful presentation really wonderful thoughtful answers um yeah 